Hello, my name is Janet Weiss. I'm a retired teacher. I wrote When We Were Shadows when I was in my retirement years. Well, I'm still in my retirement years. When I was a little girl, I used to watch my father shine his medals and I would help him because he was a soldier in the war. And I would ask him questions and he would never talk about anything from that time except the people that he met. As I grew older, I learned more about the war and the Holocaust from books and movies. And sometimes my dad would give us a little hint, but those were dark times and he just couldn't talk about it. The Holocaust is also known as the Shoah. The Shoah was when six million people were killed just because they were Jewish. Others were killed because of their religion, culture, ability, and race. They were dark, dark times. If there were any lessons learned from this time, it was to develop a sense of justice and always stand up for what you think is right, no matter what, and respect everyone, no matter their religion or who they are. Always remember that love is stronger than hate. You are the last generation to have the privilege to get to know Holocaust survivors. It's up to you and me and other writers to keep their stories alive so that this never happens again. We must be their voices. At the beginning of the book, I have a poem that set the stage for the whole plot and book. I'm going to read it to you now. It's from Abraham Sotendorp, who is a rabbi from Amsterdam. Because you have been where you have been, and I am now where I am now, I will never be able completely to be where you have been. And you will never be able completely to be where I am now. But we can tell each other the story, and that will be enough. So in this book, Walter, the boy, who is the real name of the man I interviewed, he is telling the story to his granddaughter 50 years later, and he's also writing letters and telling his grandma um, what he's feeling. But he's telling his granddaughter because she has never experienced what he experienced, and he never experienced what she experienced because he basically lost his childhood. This story is based on a true story. It's based on the story of a man I met in Amsterdam. When I was 12 years old, I had a pen pal in Holland. He had to learn to speak English, so he put an ad in the Regina Leader Post, and I answered, and we were pen pals for the rest of our lives. When I went to visit them in Holland in 2005, they took me to see a place called Het Verskollendorp, the hidden village. It's the place where a hundred people hid for 18 months during World War II in the Veluwe Forest in Holland. This book is about Walter, who it's Zev's name when he was a, a boy. What Walter went through, his feelings, his confusion about why are people doing this to me? What's wrong with being Jewish? Why do I have to whisper? Why can't you tell me what's going on? All of those feelings and emotions from the time he's five. 
So what happened was I went to see the hidden village. I sat in the huts. I looked at the table. I The table's right there. The bunks are here. I could smell the wet dirt. It reminded me of the cellar in Saskatchewan in our little in our little house. And I I couldn't even imagine being stuck in a small space like that with nine other people. No bathroom, no toilet, no privacy. Food was rare, and you had to whisper all the time. I I just have no concept of, of what that would feel like. So I needed to write about it because I felt that children in Canada and United States needed to know the story. They needed to know about the hidden village, about what went on and how it came to be. So I I did a lot of research, I contacted a lot of people, and I ended up meeting Zev. He was one of the last survivors of the Hidden Village. I phoned him and I said, I would like to interview you to write it so I can write a book about your experiences. Can we do it over the phone? And he laughed and he said, we cannot do this on the phone. You must come to Amsterdam. So I went to Amsterdam. And I spent four days with Zev at his dining room table, remembering, laughing, crying, mostly, and writing down all his stories, taping them. We became friends and then I went home and I started writing. This book is based on those stories. It all started for Zev or Walter, I'll call him Walter now, when he was five years old in Germany. Jews couldn't do anything in Germany. They couldn't have businesses. This was 1937. So father who actually was a decathlete champion for Germany, um, he decided that he was going to take his family to Holland, where it was safer. So they all packed up. Poor little Walter had no idea what was going on, just had to make sure that his little monkey was with him in his rucksack and his um, valise suitcase. And off they went to Holland. And they lived there for three years. And dad had a coffee and tea shop. And Zev went to school and had some funny adventures, as you'll see in the book. Those are some of the more lighthearted parts. Um, and then Holland was invaded. And at first, Things weren't too bad because uh, the Nazis thought that maybe Holland would be on their side because their queen had married a man um, from Germany. But no, the Dutch were not happy about the invasion and they fought back as much as they could. And eventually the family had to move from, they were in Den Haag, The Hague, and they had to move inland because they all had to be away from the water. I never found out the reasoning for that. Before they left, there was um, a business down the street from Walter's father. He And it was a butcher shop. And the butcher came over one day and he said, you have to leave. I will keep your store open and send you the money wherever you are until you come back and then I will give you the keys back. And I will take all your valuables that you need to hide and I will keep them at 
my house. And Walter's father thought, I don't know this man very well, but he took a leap of faith and he gave him the keys. As it turned out, it was all done in good faith. You'll see that. They moved to Nunspate. Walter went to school for a little while, I think, then. He couldn't go to school anymore, and he started working with the farmers. And he had some adventures, but things started to get darker and scarier, and they couldn't have bikes, and they couldn't have radios, and then they couldn't go to school. And um, the police and other people in the town were always very good, and they would warn them when anybody was coming for, to do a raid or to look for people. So they always had their rucksacks, you know it as a backpack, packed and at the door. So if they had to run, they grabbed it. Can you imagine being in a situation like that? Never knowing where you're going or when so things went along for a while and they would hide in the house across the street by um that used to used to have people in it and they would go in and they would go up the stairs on their bums so that they could see what was happening in front of them and they would stay upstairs so that if the they came around with a light they wouldn't see them upstairs and then one day, somebody came and told them, you have to leave right now. In the middle of the meal, they grabbed their rucksacks and off they went. And this is something Walter didn't know. And he had a sister who was with them as well. He didn't know that his parent, well, his, yeah, his sister was in hospital for most of this going on. He didn't know that his parents had been stocking up this caravan, which is kind of like a little scamper trailer. So when he gets there, he finds all these things. It's like, where did these come from? So they live in this little trailer for a while until a plane crashes. And they know it's near them. So when uh, the Nazis start coming to find the pilots. They're going to see the caravan. They're going to get suspicious. So they got all dressed up and they sat there and they waited because they knew that the resistance would come to help them. After that, they went to a safe house. And there is a whole... There's a whole number of different places that they hid. Um including the hidden village that you will read about and all of the things that happened. There was a safe house. There was the forest. There were the foresters' huts. And then there was the village. The village is a big part of the book because it's got the replica huts that you can see. These are what they looked like. You can see but this is the ground and underneath here is where they dug out the holes and built a hut. That looks like this inside. 10 people at a time sometimes. So as they're all, they, they, there were people from the, safe house that was attacked they were all together there were about 20 people and they needed place to stay so people in the village decided well let's build some little huts in the forest and the foresters won't chop any trees down in that area so they could camouflage the huts and you can see that the stuff on the, the dirt and the grass and the um, trees all camouflaged it anyway because it was basically a hole in, the, in like a hillock. So 
they built this house, uh, houses, huts, on four different quadrants. And the quadrants were fire roads. So the jeeps, the Nazis' jeeps, <clears throat> would go up and down the fire roads, and they wouldn't see anything inside. And they wouldn't go into the forest because they were always afraid of snipers. So there's a couple of chapters, two or three chapters, maybe four, dedicated to the hidden village, to the building of it, the living in it, and the people in the resistance that helped them. There was a couple who lived in Nunspeit, Opa Bakker and Tante Kaur. And everybody loved them. And they would get on their bicycles and they would come out every Sunday and they would bring fresh bread, um, something else that they may have gotten through ration stamps that had been so stolen, and candy for Walter. So they lived in the hidden village for 18 months until it was attacked. The attack resulted in six people losing their lives and the rest scattered to the wind. And it was up to the resistance to get everybody places to hide after that. Everything was destroyed. So all of these pictures that you see here, they are replica huts, like I said before. Walter ran on his own because it was he didn't even have a chance to get his rucksack. His parents ran. They ended up meeting outside the forest and hiding in a barn. The resistance, they, like, not everybody knew who was in the resistance all the time, but they had such a wide net that they used to help people. Eventually, Walter and his family were um, hidden in a farm where the farmer was standing like this saying, you better not be Jewish. If you're Jewish, I'm turning you in. And um, they had to really hide the fact that they were. And there's an episode at Christmas time that's really difficult for Walter's mother because she played piano and the farm wife wanted her to play Christmas carols. Well, Walter's mother didn't know how to play Christmas carols. So Walter and the mom had to go out behind the house, the farm, and he had to sing Christmas carols he knew so she could learn the music because she played by ear. Eventually, they had to leave the farm. They went to another uh, farm where there was a woman that Walter's father knew, and it was like a little respite in the whole horror of everything. There were two daughters, so Walter could play. They could play outside. They could talk. They could yell. He could bath in a bathtub. There was an inside toilet. Um, they, they were safe there until the Nazis started looking for men and boys to work in their camps because we're getting close to the end of the war now. So the last place that Walter ended up was like a boarding house in a city called Zola. A lot of intrigue happened before he actually set foot in that house. He was pretending to be the nephew of the man who owned the house. He learned a lot about nature from the man. He got, they got along really well. He, Walter was separated from his family. So, and his, his, um, the mother of the house, she would take him into the kitchen and, and he would help her cook. And, but he, every time the doorbell rang, he would run outside and hide. And in this house, there was a Nazi officer. 
which Walter tried to stay away from. So he made sure he was never up and out about when the officer was going to do his uh, work for the day. The book ends with the Canadians liberating Zola. And the last chapter, it always makes me cry. <laughs> It'll, it might make you cry, but it, it's like Walter has this huge volcano of feelings that come up that he can finally explode and use his real name and feel free and be out in the sun and be able to live his life not the way it was before and probably different from anybody else who survived the war who wasn't in hiding. So the end of the book gives you a little bit of information about what Walter did after the war. It talks about the people who were in the resistance and who were named righteous Gentiles um, by Yad Vashem. It, um, it's a book that tells Walter's story from his point of view, from the time he was five until he was almost 14. So if you're interested in hearing more or anything about Walter or about the research, I can come to your school if you live in Calgary um, and talk to you if you don't live in Calgary. We could do it online. Um, I'm going to put up my information and maybe if we can get it, maybe your teacher can take a screenshot of it. I love to tell the story. Um, I became very close to Walter. Um, he taught me many things about survival and um, remember, love is stronger than hate. Thank you.